In today's video, I'll take you to the basics of building an enshrouded. From claiming your first piece of land with a flame altar to crafting your first construction hammer and beyond. The first step to building your dream base is claiming your piece of the wilderness. This is where the flame altar comes into place. It's surprisingly easy to craft, requiring only 6 stones. Once crafted, place it in your toolbar and select it. Placing it will claim a reasonable area of 40 by 40 by 40 meters, creating a zone for you to start building in. The building radius of a flame altar is centered around the altar itself, extending in all directions. The altar's influence can be expanded through upgrades, extending its radius with each enhancement, reaching up to 160 meters at its max. Be mindful when placing or thinking about moving your flame altar. Removing it deletes all building blocks and chests within its radius, but this only happens after you reload the game, restart the server, or leave the area for 2 hours. It is possible to move your altar by building another altar in the location you prefer, and then removing the initial altar. You just need to make sure that your building is completely covered by the second altar to avoid losing anything. That can of course be done by building several altars as well, or by upgrading the radius of it. The amount of altars that can be built per world is limited. Currently, at the making of this video, you can upgrade the flame to build a maximum of 8 altars. If you're playing in multiplayer or on a server, you will need to be economical with these and probably decide to build together around the same flame. With your land claimed, it's time to start building. The first tool you'll need is a construction hammer. Crafting a construction hammer is straightforward. You just need one stone, which can easily be found around you. Open up your crafting menu, select the construction hammer and craft it. Once you build the hammer, you also will need to craft building blocks. Initially, you'll start with the basic blocks like stone, wood and flint. You'll craft these blocks at the workbench using resources you have gathered. For example, mining stone and flint will grant you rough stone and flint blocks and also shingle roofs. Chopping wood will grant you wooden blocks, plant fiber will allow you fiber roofs and so on. Later, you will be able to craft more fancy blocks. Unlocking most of the blocks is by progressing the game and mining resources. Some of the exclusive blocks will be behind mini-bosses, dungeons or puzzles. There are currently 31 building blocks and 6 roof blocks. Building an enshrouded becomes much easier once you're familiar with the building UI. To access the building menu, you'll need your construction hammer equipped. Once it's in your hand, press the tap button. This action opens up your building menu, revealing the range of building blocks at your disposal. Across the bottom of the screen, you'll see your current toolbar, which shows the blocks you have selected. On the right side of the menu, there's a list of all the building block types available to you, along with the quantities you have in your inventory. Switching between different types of block is simple. By pressing the Alt key and scrolling with your mouse wheel, you can navigate through your toolbar. There you can choose between different size prefab parts, terrain editing tools or voxel building. Each category is marked with an icon. Green mountains for terrain editing, blue bricks for building blocks and orange roofs for roof tiles. Switching between these categories changes the navigation bar on the right to display the relevant materials, making it easy to find what you need. By pressing Ctrl and using the mouse wheel, you can scroll through different material types. With a solid understanding of the building UI, you're well on your way to become an efficient builder in Enshrouded. Next, we'll explore the principles of the building grid and snap points. The first time you come across the building grid occurs when you're placing your flame altar. However, it is important to note that the altar does not determine the grid's orientation. The grid is globally fixed, which means that all structures adhere to this predetermined grid layout. The fixed grid orientation does feel like a restriction, especially for builders dreaming of round structures. I believe that because of how this game is designed, it might be hard to get free rotation for building blocks, but who knows. Either way, the grid only allows for a 90 degree rotation for all building blocks. For furnishing and non-structural elements, you have more flexibility as you can rotate them freely. Once you build your altar, you will be able to work from its snap point or start building somewhere in the altar's radius. With snap points, your block will automatically align with adjacent blocks. You can toggle snap points on and off by pressing X, which allow you to freely place your parts onto the grid. Both options have their applications. Placing build parts can be a little confusing, especially if you come from a Valheim building background. In Enshrouded, your building block will be placed where your cursor is aimed at. So, to place the block at the location you want, you need to move your character and cursor. 
It is possible to move the block closer or further away from your character, but most of the time you will still need to be walking around to place a part in its spot. Moving your block further or closer away from your character is done by pressing Q and scrolling the mouse wheel. It's also possible to move your camera further or closer from your character, which can be handy sometimes for more detailed placement. To do this, you can press Z and scroll your mouse wheel up or down. When placing a block, keep an eye on the resource counter on your screen. This feature shows how many blocks you're using and how much of your resources are left. Interestingly, when blocks merge, the overall resource cost can decrease. This happens because you're only using materials for the space the block occupies, not for the overlapping areas. For instance, if you notice using less materials when placing a pillar into the floor, it's because the pillar has merged with the floor block. Apart from being economical, you can also use that number to indicate if you're placing the block in the correct position. This can be very handy to ensure that you're building each block at the same height or depth. Voxel building allows for precision down to the individual block, enabling you to craft detailed features or adjust parts of your build for a custom look. This method is perfect for when you want to go beyond what prefabs offer, allowing for detailed adjustments. By using voxel removal, you can clear away parts of your wall to place a window or a door in later. Placing voxels is done by left mouse button and removing voxels is done with right mouse button. One of the nice advantages of voxel building I found so far is to fine tune the look of your roofs for example. You can use it to either make nice trimmings or even support beams inside the roof. The best way to do this is by using a different type of roof against the roof you originally built. That will avoid the blocks from merging. For example, with a shingle roof, it's preferred to detail the beams and trimming with the roof tile blocks. This will make the wooden trim stand out more and look more like a beam. While it might take you a few minutes to figure it out, it is a pretty simple technique once you understand it. While already having touched on the building controls, it's good to understand the difference between building and removing of voxel and prefab building. When it comes to voxel building, precision is key. The game visually indicates which face of an existing block your new voxel will adhere to, be it building or removing. Prefab blocks, on the other hand, offer a more straightforward approach. When selecting a prefab block, you'll see a ghost image of the block in its intended location, making it easier to visualize and place large sections of your structure quickly. Removing is done by aiming any prefab block against the prefab structure until the remove icon appears. Then right click to take it down. Just to repeat, the remove icon will only show when holding a prefab block in hand. When you have a voxel selected or terrain, this icon will not appear. Another handy and probably one of the most useful tools at your disposal is the undo function. By pressing Y, you can revert the last five actions you've taken, whether building or terraforming. This function is incredibly handy for correcting mistakes or reconsidering design choices without the need to manually remove or adjust each block. Remember, this only works when you're in build mode. Starting your project with prefab structures is a strategy I highly recommend. It allows for rapid assembly of your build framework, which you can then detail or modify using voxel blocks. Even after cutting out spaces for windows or doors, prefab blocks maintain their integrity, enabling easy removal or adjustment in whole pieces. In any construction project, reaching those hard to get spots can be a challenge. This is where scaffolding comes into play. Scaffolding can be crafted at the workbench, requiring minimal resources. Just put the scaffolding in your toolbar, simply place it into your desired location, climb up and you got the perfect platform to build higher up. When the scaffolding is no longer needed or needs to be moved, you can pick it up and place it elsewhere. However, you can also make your own quick scaffoldings by just building some stairs and platforms. It will be handy as you will not need to constantly switch between toolbars and it will also take less space in your inventory. Just make sure you do not build the stairs or platforms into the terrain as they will shape it. You can of course always fix it with terrain blocks or the rake, but it's easy to avoid. In the next section, we talk about block contextual shaping, a feature that allows blocks to alter shape or texture based on their placement relative to other blocks. For example, the way roofs interact with each other as explained before, the principle applies also to walls, windows, doors, pillars and more. You can use this to your advantage if you want to add more detailing and personality to your build. The best way to understand the potential of block contextual shaping is through experimentation. Try combining different block types and observe how they interact. You might discover new design possibilities that you hadn't considered before. 
But what is a house without windows, doors and furniture? You can craft these essential items at your workbench or with the carpenter, along with lights and other decorative elements that add ambience and character to your builds. However, remember that these items don't automatically carve out the necessary spaces and walls. You'll need to prepare these openings beforehand, ensuring they fit seamlessly into your design. Once crafted, placing windows and doors is straightforward. Add them to your toolbar, select them and then position them where you want them. If you're not satisfied with the placement or you unlock better designs, simply aim at the item and pick it up and remove it. Furniture like beds and tables can be freely rotated. Just disable snap points, hold R and rotate with your mouse wheel. And these are just a few basics of building an enshrouded. I hope you found these insights and techniques valuable in starting or enhancing your own building efforts. If you enjoyed this guide and found it helpful, a like is greatly appreciated as it always helps builders like you finding this video. And remember, the building community thrives on shared knowledge. So if you have any tips, tricks or unique building experience of your own, please share them in the comments below. For more guides and tips on Enchrouder or any other games, be sure to check out the channel or perhaps this video here. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time. Beeblebum out.